Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Becoming the 1% Podcast. Today, my guest is the incredible Rhonda Raschik. She is the single most decorated racquetball player in U.S. history for the female division. Our talk today is unbelievable. Hearing how she started, hearing what she went through, and the ordeal that led up to her competition in Worlds, what she was able to overcome, and where she's at today is truly inspiring. I hope you guys enjoy the episode. What's up, Rhonda? Uh, how you doing, Brandon? I'm good. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I've been I've been looking forward to this place. I see all the pictures and the videos, and I'm like, what is that? I, I got I got to go check this out. Yeah, we had this scheduled for what at least a few months, right? This a couple is, of months. Yeah, yeah. yeah we we're yeah. gonna try to hit hit it in October and uh, scheduling, scheduling switched. Yeah. yeah. Well, this you're, is you're just too popular, man. We <laughs> which we're trying. It uh, it got to the point where this was delayed a few months just the creation of this place, so it took a while for us to kind of push everybody forward and yeah. just kind of get the schedule rolling. Yeah. But um, I like to start these off by hearing from you. I want to hear what it is you've been doing and how you got to the place you're at with the Olympics, with your sport. So talk to me about that. I want to kind of get to know you a little bit uh, here at the beginning. All right. Um, I started playing racquetball and basketball at the wonderful age of two. Uh, my parents joined the health club when I was two. I figured out how to sneak out of the nursery and uh, I would just kind of wander around find out which court my dad was on my dad had just started to play racquetball with my godfather and he was kind of learning the game gotcha i would sneak out my mom was either doing aerobics or playing uh tennis with my godmother and i snuck out wander around find my dad like oh there he is yeah. then i'd go down to the basketball court and grab a basketball and i would just kind of keep an eye on that court and when he would come out between games i'd run up and steal his racket and go in there and you know whack it around a little bit and i honestly it's kind of funny up until um, I started, you know, when I started the pro tour and I started having success early on and everything, and I started doing interviews, mm -hmm. I always get asked, how'd you get started? And I don't think either one of my parents realized until they heard some of my interviews that I was sneaking out of the nursery. I think my dad always assumed my mom took me out and my mom always assumed my dad took me out. So it was, it was interesting to hear you play that. on your own at two. It was, yeah. that's how old you were when you started interesting, yeah. like getting interested in it. Well, I just, I just didn't want to be in there doing you know, dumb little kid stuff. I wanted to go do, you know, adult yeah. stuff. And so I, I, like I said, I'd watch my dad grab a basketball, run up, steal his racket. And, nice. and uh, you know, he would just kind of little proud papa moment in a way. Yeah. And then he'd be like, okay, kid, give the big people the racket back. Now, what are you doing out here? Where's your mother? You know? <laughs> and that's essentially what I did with my life. I mean, I can literally show you a picture on my phone of me at, at two with yeah. a lap full of racquetball rackets while I'm hugging a basketball. <laughs> Um, so, and which I, one did you take to quicker basketball uh, and racquetball? It, both. I mean, I did both, both every day and I, it was because I wanted to, I remember yeah. my, my parents got divorced when I was five. So mm -hmm. I would go back and forth and, and every time I was with my dad, I wanted to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go play at the gym before school. I wow. wanted to go shoot hoops. I wanted to go play a few racquetball games. I wanted to go lift and do all of that before getting to like, nobody made me. Mm -hmm. I made him like he played, you know, he had his little morning league with the, the, the older guys. Um, but like I wanted to go and do do my thing at the gym and then of course I played basketball in school mm -hmm. And so and then I'd have practice after and then we actually started in are Arizona. You, are you from Arizona? Yeah, I was born you? here. Oh, six. Yeah. you're local. Yep. Oh, Native. cool. Us yep. too. Sweet. Yeah, that's rare. That's I know, get a lot of people that are local. Yeah, and then and then everyone else assumes that we all know each other. So yeah, <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you more nice than I didn't you. know already. <laughs> Where'd you go to high school? Thunderbird. Oh, sick. That's awesome. Yeah, I think CHS. we played you guys in high school. It's a, Where'd you go? A Gilbert Christian. Oh, right down the, yeah, right, right down, down the road, the both of us. Yeah, yeah, I know. We definitely stayed local. Didn't stay here forever. I left and went to California for four years, then came back. He went to Texas. I did so too. So we, we got out to California or Texas? California. Nice. Which part? Uh, I lived in Hermosa for two years and then Ladera Ranch for two years. Okay. Did you go there for like college or did you? No, just uh, I was dating someone and uh -huh. then just and instead of driving back and forth, I just stayed out there for a couple of years. Nice. That ended. Didn't want to leave right away. Had an opportunity to stick around for another couple of years and then... Actually, a buddy of mine here said, hey, I know you're in California right now, but you you know, for when you come back, would you want to move in as roommates and, mm -hmm. and split the rent so I can buy a house faster? I'm like, sure, no problem. Well, then I found out that I was actually spending more time here. So then instead of having a place in each state, I came back here and stayed here. Got it. So when did you get competitive with racquetball? When when was it yeah. actually? Yeah. Yeah. My, my dad had some dumb double digit rule that I could never understand that he wouldn't let me play tournaments until I was 10. Um, mm. and I got my ass kicked and at 10, at, I played my first junior nationals at 11, got absolutely smashed by a very lovely person 
named Vanessa Taleo, who uh, within within that year, we became super tight and doubles partners and we're both on the junior u.s team together for many years were you both the same age playing at the same time or was yeah 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 because all, all the junior stuff is based on age divisions got it so we were in the 12 and under at that point and she just <laughs> she smashed me but you kind of have to and gotta then get... i and then i got mad at him i'm like why'd you hold me back like why like i i could be so much better if you'd let me start sooner you know <laughs> but i mean i literally she and i teamed up i think we might have actually won the 12 and under doubles the following year so i mean it was it was a rapid acceleration to um starting to have early success once i started playing more tournaments and mm -hmm. i mean honestly i've always believed that the fastest way to get better is to play better people like the, oh, the, 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 the the more you can get your ass kicked and learn from it yeah. the faster you're gonna you're gonna grow yeah in anything get sports better. business all that kind of stuff always Great. looking ahead finding people that are better than you exactly and the higher you go the more you will i think you kind of have to search you know what i mean like if you're if you're in, a, you're in the olympics now so now how do you find somebody who's so actually racquetball is not an olympic sport yet Okay, but I am I, I am on the U.S. team. We do have a national team that competes internationally. We have our worlds, um, world games that were just in in Birmingham over the summer with all all the different sports. Mm -hmm. We're also in the Pan Am Games, which are every four years. We have our own racquetball Pan Am Championships that's every year. Um, our world championships are, uh, I think, every two years. Wow. Um, so I mean, we we still compete as internationally as possible, but our sport is not specifically in the Olympics yet. However. I know they're they're taking drastic measures to make a big push, aiming to get us in sooner than later. Because I mean, it's basically been you know the Olympic dream of racquetball since it's since I was a kid. The Olympics, that's kind of weird. It, I mean, how long has racquetball been established? Our grandpa played it when he was younger than us. Joe Sobek invented it in the I think either the late sixties or early seventies. Yeah. So it's I mean it's as a sport it's fairly young. However. I mean, as you just said before, we even got hot mics. You, you you used to play, or you know, you played until you got hit in the back, or and everybody has that racquetball story. Yeah. I mean, every single person I've sat next to on a plane when I'm going to a tournament. Oh, why are you going to Kansas? Mm -hmm. Business or pleasure? I'm like, well, I love my job. Can't that be both? Mm -hmm. I mean, I get to hit for a living. I get I get to play a sport yeah. for a living. Like yeah. it's it's great. This is your full time job. How long? Uh, so yes and no. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. but like I said, I've actually taken time off. Uh, this season is the first time I've missed any pro stops other than I missed three after my dad died in 2016. Gotcha. This is the first season I've, I've intentionally taken off some time from the tour away because I'm actually developing, had a lot, a lot of things just come my way that have been too good to say no to as far as a uh, speaking career, uh, coaching. And I'm also writing a book that's due out in early spring. Awesome. Or let's, late spring. Let's start with coaching. What, uh, yeah. what age division do you work with? Well, I mean, I'm any age as far as anything athletic or fitness or whatever, but I mean, I mean like, you know, coaching people, you know, just through, you know, mindset through, um, going through a tough time, um, shifting perspective, uh, sure. offering, offering tools to move it. And it doesn't matter whether it's athletics, business, personal, um, just sort of kind of helping people maximize their own gifts that they're unaware of. Wow. So sort of, would you call it life coaching? No, because I don't like that either. No, it's that's why I asked it like that. And I and I I don't want to say motivation. I don't want to say mindset hack. Like I don't I don't want to use the bu the buzzwords because it's not, it's not it's not it's not that gimmick. Mm -hmm. It's it's what do you what where are you? What do you need? And what is there anything that I have or that I've experienced or any perspective I can offer that can help you? Mm -hmm. It's it's not um it's it, it's not packaged in any specificity of. Oh, here's what I do. No, I don't actually do anything. I, I pose you some questions and get you to think about certain things that mm -hmm. you you have shared the information with me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just asking you to look, look at it through a different lens and see what you can figure out for yourself. Yeah. How long have you been doing that kind of thing? Uh, <laughs> so, how do you transition from, I'm an athlete, I'm a good athlete, I'm a great athlete, now let me coach and teach others? Because I have always believed that athletics, it doesn't matter the sport, I've always believed that sport is, is a mirror for life. And there's a lot of things that you can learn in life that can help you in sport and a lot of things you can learn from sport that help you in life. And I've also had the benefit of being a dual sport athlete, one which is an individual sport where it's all on me mm -hmm. and once where it's a team sport where Absolutely. you've got to be able to work together, trust each other and count on each other and have each other's back no matter what and figure out how to do that chemistry wise so that all the, the team as a whole can be successful. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all of that goes into, you know, so many different dynamics between, you know, your own personal hell that you might be trying to navigate mm -hmm. and come through. And it also relates to, you know, even a, a family dynamic or a business team dynamic mm -hmm. or, you know, growing into something that is that is bigger than where you're currently at. All of yeah. those things are applicable to the dynamic of building a successful sports team or mm -hmm. sports career. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And the difference between the singular athlete and the team athlete and the fact that you've done both is actually very cool because it's true. Sometimes, you know, the whole I don't play well with others thing, Mm -hmm. you know, there are guys that fit that guys and gals who fit that description in both sports and business. What would you say? Other than the obvious, what is the difference between a team sport athlete and a singular sport? Am I correct in calling it a singular yeah. athlete sport? I don't even know what to call it. Like so, a solo. I mean, solo. Solo. So the. I mean, even if you got coaching or you you know you've got teammates. For example, racquetball is a very individual sport. Mm-hmm. I I I spend an enormous amount of time completely alone without mm-hmm. without my coach without you know, a, a significant other without, you know, that, that one fan that I know will always stand there and help me with a, if I need a towel or a Gatorade, you know, mm-hmm. like it's all on me to be completely prepared, have everything I need, yeah. you know, so that I'm, I'm, I'm not looking for anything. I'm not reaching for anything between on a timeout or between games or what have you. Sure. Um, so, uh, the, I would say that the biggest difference is in the solo sport of racquetball, now, don't get me wrong. There's doubles. And even on, on the U.S. team, I mean, it is a team. And all of the people that I'm on the team with, the, the, they're rooting the, for you. those same women are the ones that I play against the rest of the year. Yeah. Like, they're, they're, they're my enemies on the court every other time. Mm-hmm. But when we all come together with USA on our back, it's, a te- it's very much a team thing. And we're there to support each other. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. Know, it's, and represent. It, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, it's a different feeling. And you, I mean, it's notably different, I think for, for all of us, those mm-hmm. one or two times a year where we come together as team USA mm-hmm. in an individual sport where we're usually at each other's throats on the court. Sure. But that's also one of the really cool things about rock. Well, I just got to throw this in. It's such a, it is such a almost family dynamic of like, you just don't hear it very often. Like that, that's something that two people have in common is, is, is the sport of racquetball. Mm-hmm. You know, you say pickleball and everybody, like, Oh yeah, we have courts in my neighborhood, you know, sure. but racquetball is kind of like that special thing. Um, where if you play and you know, someone who plays and you've been to a tournament and you know what that's like, there's like, there's like kind of an unspoken bond in that way. Sure. So anyway, um, it's, it's a very notable difference when we could literally be at each other's throat in in a tournament Mm -hmm. like i just played you in the finals and now now i want you to win and now i'm rooming with you Uh Uh, yeah (laughs) yeah. i'm rooming with you (laughs) and we're playing doubles together and you know so it's it's such a it's an interesting it's an interesting thing about our sport but i would say the biggest difference is which do you prefer singles or doubles if you had a preference ah i can't i don't even know (laughs) i mean they're 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 so different i mean at this at this top level when you watch pro racquetball doubles it's so exciting and it's like it's like a really it's it's like a 200 mile an hour ballet almost because it's because it's so fast shockingly physical yeah. so yes. pull up that video we were watching before we started this i, I mean I, it's not but that it's, i've it's i've like seen a poetry i've emotion, seen racquetball really. done in gyms and places like that i've never seen it done at this level i was i mean it's shocking how aggressive it really is oh yeah who is okay so Okay, so this is you versus is this is she the representative from Mexico? Yeah, she's 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 probably the winningest. Fe- yeah, she is not probably she is the winningest female racquetball player ever. Um, so she has the most victories in a competitive setting officially. Uh, you know, I don't know, and the only reason I'm saying I, I don't know is because I've been playing longer than she has. Mm-hmm. I know at one time I had more, but she's 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 certainly been more consistent. She's she's certainly dominated the last. Wow several years how do you even see the ball uh, well and that that's the thing like you don't have time to think this game is so fast you kind of have to know where it's going before it gets there and you have to fi- you have to you can't figure out what you're going to do with it on your way there like it's too fast i i have so many questions about that because I, again i haven't played this in a competitive setting what happens if i hit my opponent with the ball so it depends um depending on the circumstance of positioning and shot selection uh-huh. it's either a hinder which is just a replay Okay. Or is, there's a ref, I assume, behind yes, the glass yes, watching. Yes. Okay. Um, one ref. One ref and two line judges. Oh, uh, interesting. Well, it, not every match has line judges, but there there's three opinions, that, especially in, in in the finals like this. Is this worlds? Is this like your big? And this is Pan Am Championships in Chile. Got it in Chile. Oh wow. Tweener. <laughs> <laughs> I seriously, that's like that behind the or not behind behind the back and in between the legs. Yeah, yeah that's another much, one. Oh my gosh, how many? Did you... <laughs> Got it. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Why have I not seen this? I'm, I did I feel not. Like I'm you haven't seen this. My own match right now. This is insane. 
I can't believe how many times you like lay out straight into the wall, which is a c concrete wall, correct? Am I right on that? Well, I mean, they make so, it out of like a very firm surface. So it's either concrete or panel, and I, I don't actually recall. I, I'm pretty sure these are actually concrete. Um, <laughs> our, but I mean, we have, you can see the, the back wall. Oh, glass. wow. They got, you got like a whole. Yeah. But so, I mean, our, like our US Open has, has an all glass portable court that is erected in a certain venue to whatever where the the venue is going to be oh, okay for um just for the u.s open okay um so i mean courts are always going to be made of glass uh panel or concrete or some combination of of all three yeah talk to me about the training involved for this particular sport i mean do you find that there is any one style of obviously hand eye and cns coaching has a huge part to play but what about what about strength training what about i mean okay, endurance so, what do you do so <laughs> i get asked about my training all the time and i'm very private and protective about it because i don't want to give away my secrets however uh -huh. i will say this i had somebody ask me what you know what do you what do you do for your training and i'm sure. like i you know I, I do a ton of different modalities mm -hmm. of training you know and he goes oh do you lift weights i said of course i lift weights mm -hmm. and he goes what do you do for cardio i said i lift weights faster there you go <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I, I do, I mean, I do everything that is meant to be functional so that it's translating to my game to have maximum power, mm -hmm. maximum explosion. Oh yeah. I need, obviously I need to, to have quick feet, Plus, um, stretch shortening cycle, all that kind of stuff. Ton, ton of, ton of, uh, ton of core, um, stability, strength and stability. Mm -hmm. Cause that's where you generate the power. The power doesn't come from the arm. It comes from the hips. Yep. Um, and you obviously like you, golf wanna, swing. you want to hit the ball low, so you want to be able to to stay low. Mm -hmm. so and you, gotta, you do that very well. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> tell hey. my coach that he's always in between the legs. He's always telling me to get lower and backwards. <laughs> so you have a coach. Do you have a strength coach? Do you have a nutrition coach? I mean, how many people? I, I do not. Um, I well, although I have been blessed to know a lot of really great trainers mm -hmm. o over my, over the course of my not just my career but my life. You yeah, know? my my whole family. I didn't I didn't even go into family history. Not yet. Short short short. Short explanation on the fam in a bit, but, uh -huh. um, yeah, I, I just, I've learned a lot from a lot of people uh -huh. and, and I've been able to kind of play with certain things and, you know, maybe I was given this advice, but maybe I tweak it like this to serve my sport a little more specifically. Sure. Um, I would actually, ironically, I would say the two sports that are closest to, um, a racquetball scenario, and this is going to sound, actually there's three. Okay. Basketball for okay. footwork football for certain ways of of efficiency uh -huh. and uh you get a lot of lateral movements and stuff you and, don't get a ton in basketball and and ufc what you do on defense wait did you say, did you just say that there's not a lot of lateral movement i played basketball there's a basketball of, there's a ton of lateral that, movement. it's like <laughs> it's not 50 just percent of the game is lateral movement on defense. you think it's 50 percent of the game 70 you, yeah it, 70. it's probably more than that yeah yeah well that might have been a stupid comment i'll give you that, <laughs> I'll give you that. Tell you what, we'll play one on one. I'll, I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry. I totally say what you were saying again. He. I just think that the 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 three the three. <laughs> Thank sports, you. Like if I was gonna pick. Yeah, and UFC three sports to cross. Why them. UFC? Because you have to read and react so quickly. Mm -hmm. You're in close proximity to someone else who's who you're trying to hit and who's trying to hit you. Mm -hmm. You have to not only try to land your your stuff, but you have to be able to maneuver away from theirs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same. How thing. How big is the room? One. Court. Court. How big is the court? Uh, it's 20 by 40 by 20. Got it. So you standing and then, okay, so the but two But the ball of you, can only bounce once. And you you mentioned the word hinder. I mean, if I hit and then I block the ball from her being able to hit it, is that what that is? So the tech, I mean, the, the, the rule is, I didn't, I didn't actually get to finish that answer. There's a hinder, which is a replay, or a penalty hinder, which will result in a point or a side out. Uh. A penalty hinder means that you took away an offensive opportunity for a straight in or a cross court. Now, under those exact same circumstances, if I'm going for a straight in and I hit you because you're directly in front of me, that's a penalty hinder in my favor. Okay. If if I'm in going for a different shot, say I'm going for a pinch, which means it's going into the corner, mm -hmm. not straight in, that's a regular hinder because I'm not you don't have to give me that. You don't have to give me the corner. You have to give me the straight in and you have to give me the cross court. So it's your job as my opponent to get out of my way if I'm yes. going to hit it straight at the wall in front of me. Yes. Gotcha. Which I don't know if you, I don't know if there's any of it in this clip, but I, for court positioning purposes, you don't want to give the whole court if you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, just my my choice is to. Uh, Would it be my my choice? <laughs> my choice is to uh, get get position 
and then jump. Would it be a maybe you know, I'm not trying to say if it was a good or bad strategic idea. I mean, does anyone is it ever an idea to hit your opponent if you think you can get that that hinder? No, because now you're no. relying on the ref to make a to make a, a subjective call. Gotcha. Like it, like I mean, there's there's penalty hinders that don't get called because the ref doesn't. Can a penalty and, hinder ever be given to the person who hit the ball? I that, mean, if he thinks you hit the person on purpose. If you hit the person on purpose, it, there, there's no there's no offense committed other than you're an asshole. Nothing. Oh wow. <laughs> see, because I could see like I mean, if somebody but, was. If I didn't like the way someone was playing or I didn't like the way he's, I mean, maybe. I mean, they're, they're, tr so I have seen, you know, I have seen matches where there's been a retaliation or two, uh -huh. but I mean, nobody, nobody scores a point. And again, now you're relying on the ref to make a call one way or the other. Sure. And, it, and it's, it, I mean, that's no fun. We want to, we want to see action packed shots, not action packed bruises. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, looks like you get enough of those just on your own. <laughs> that is crazy how you lay out for each one of those shots. Uh, see, see how I mean? Like, like sh I gave her the shot, uh -huh. but I didn't get out of her way. Yeah. She still took the cross court, but I got out of the way, but I was, I, I held my position and I jumped. So she still was able to take her shot uh -huh. without me getting, you know, creating a, an infraction. Is being tall a huge advantage in this the way it is in like, say basketball? Yes and no. I mean, it allows you to have more of a reach, but at the same time, taller people tend to have poor footwork. Okay. Because they they're able to rely on that length mm -hmm. well you can't do much with the ball when you get there right you want to have two feet under you you want to be a two-legged athlete you want to be a two-legged athlete not a one-legged athlete and if i'm stretching on one foot with one arm in, in some direction uh -huh. now the first thing i have to do after i get that after i hit that shot or, or just make the get yeah. is get both feet under me but if they're already under i mean you can see the sport is so fast yeah if if you if you have both feet under you at the time that you're sh that you're striking the ball one you have more options as far as shot selection mm -hmm. because you're in a better position to hit more more opportunities and two your feet are already with you all you have to do is continue to get into position if you don't actually win the rally on that shot you mentioned getting low and staying low as a huge benefit to doing this sport is yes. being tall a disadvantage for that since you're not lower than your opponent it can be Got it. It can be. I mean, there's there's pretty much kind of an average height. There's a there's a few people that are taller than others. There's a, a couple people that would are... you be considered tall for the sport? Probably. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be all intolerant. Five ten. Five ten. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I again, it's 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 a sport of which I know very little. All the stats on the athletes, the training regiment, the movement. Do you have uh do you have siblings or anybody like that that does this with you? Dude, I'm an only child. That is the struggle bus that I'm Really? <laughs> I, I'm, I, my favorite thing to do is play catch and I have nobody to play catch with. Oh, did, okay. I mean, did that play into gravitating toward this at a young age? I mean, it's a he, gaming play by yourself? Yes, and entirely. Like uh -huh. I said when I was with my dad, I mean, the the court was kind of his babysitter and I was totally fine with that. But I mean, same thing with basketball. I mean, sure. I didn't I didn't have anybody to shoot with. I was always, you know, shooting my shot, shagging my own rebound, coming mm -hmm. back out, you know. So that's I mean, both sports I enjoy immensely, but you know, like you can't do this in tennis. You can't do this in pickleball. You can't do this no. in, you can't do this really in any other racket sport. Like you can't do this in, um, like you can practice getting reps all by yourself. Yeah. By your, yeah. Unless you, I guess, hit it against a wall in a pickleball setting type of thing. Yeah. But still, I mean, like I can actually hit real game time shots mm -hmm. against yeah. this wall because this wall is part of my game. Right. When you're hitting against a wall in those other sports, that's not part of the game. Somebody's always going to redirect the ball a different way than the wall will. Sure. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. You can do actual real adjustments to every shot you make over and over and over again. Right. How much training did you do? I mean, on average, how much do you play? I mean, competing full time, it, it really just depended on my schedule. I mean, for uh, pre-COVID, I was on the road 40 to 45 weeks a year. How did COVID impact this? Did they shut it, you down? It, it did. It killed, it killed us. We had no, we had a pro stop in Boston in early March mm -hmm. and within a, within a week of you know that tournament ending yeah. the nation shut down dang um and it was you know our, our tour is international so we had sure. a lot of international athletes so you had people that w had access to courts months before other people had access to courts because the the mandates in their country were different or the the mm. the openness versus the shutdown yeah they, <laughs> of, of some other people practice others not right and i went off on 
six different GMs at a particular gym ta- gym chain because they were literally having fitness classes where there's blue tape on the ground yeah. <laughs> telling people that you have to stay in your little square yeah. to work out during this class. But they wouldn't let me go into a racquetball court by myself to drill yeah. for months. I'm right. like, what sense does that make? You can put a bunch of people in there and and just because they're staying in their little area, you're yeah. not worried about it. But I want to go into a 40 by 20 by 20 room by myself and you won't let me go in there at all. I don't understand that. Yeah, sense didn't really have a whole lot to do with no, everything that was done during sense. that time. And especially now looking back at it, it's really kind of funny to see like what was imposed and what wasn't. You're like, it's, some of the stuff made no sense whatsoever. So backwards, yeah. Which gym do you go to to train this? I mean, I think LA Fitness has them, right? Is that right? LA Fitness, Lifetime Fitness. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, those are actually the only ones I know of in town. I mean, actually, for anybody who actually, I mean, in town, do you have one you recommend for local athletes to go to? Any? What's your What's your favorite? My favorite is the Village. Oh, I love the Village. The bougie one. <laughs> yeah, of course it's the Village. How many? I, where, uh, where is the nearest? I know there's one up by Camelback Mountain. Is there another one here near in Gilbert? There's There's several. I don't I I don't know what the closest one to Gilbert is. Um, but I know they got one in Phoenix and I know they have one in Scottsdale. Those are the only two I know. They, well, there's one way up in Northeast Scottsdale. Um, mm-hmm. The name is escaping me right now. I feel like an idiot. Uh, there's one at 44th and Camelback. Mm-hmm. There's one um, in a little further south on, in Scottsdale. I think it's off Hayden, somewhere near Hayden and Camelback-ish, Hayden and Indian School. Yeah. Uh, can't think of the name of that one either. Um, and then I know, oh, DC Ranch. That's the one way up in like Northeast Scottsdale. Got it. That's the super, super, super bougie one. Oh, is it? I've never been yeah. to that one. Yeah, I, I, I like them all. I mean, I think, I think, I think I'm a little partial to the one at forty forty fourth and Camelback because that that's was, the one I've gone to. That's the one I've spent the most time at. Yeah, I could, I get such good workouts there. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I could, I could literally stay there for like seven or eight. Are hours. there any, are there any other locals that play on the team with you? I mean, when you get to this level, or is they are throughout the country? I assume they're kind of cherry they picked are, from they all are, over. Yeah, they are. Well, they're not cherry picked. You have to qualify. We have, in fact, You're right. we, we have not all. We have a U.S. team qualifier coming up in uh, February, and it's actually here at ASU. Oh wow! You can come check it out. So everybody from all over the U.S. comes to ASU to qualify for this. Well, I mean, there's different divisions, but mm-hmm. if but U.S. team qualifying is only one of them. So there will be an amateur event with different levels and and a- skill levels and and age levels. Uh, you know, for for people to pick and choose where they want to play. Yeah. But there will be one specific um, U.S. team qualifying division. Sick. Yeah. That's awesome. When is it? Uh, first five days of February. First five days of February. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right. So yep. we'll keep that. We'll make sure everybody who wants to go check that out can go Sweet. see it at ASU. That's not awesome. far from here either. Nope. So tell me about the book. Where did it come from? Why <laughs> write a book? Yeah. What's it going to be? When's it come out? What's it? Tell me about it. Okay. So I think before we get to the book, I have to tell you about this this thing that happened okay. because because it's very central to the book, why it's being written. Um, so I'm not going to leave anything out. You guys are getting the raw the raw story, the not edited for TV content. Cool. Um, in 2008, I was living in Hermosa Beach. Um, it was late at night. I was walking down the Strand, um, and I got jumped by two guys with brass knuckles from behind. They surprised me. Um, I got my face shattered. My eyeball almost fell out. I had to have facial reconstructive surgery. What? <laughs> That's the uh, elevator version. Um, wow. But, uh, yeah, so I, I was walking along and saw some guy underneath a light and he just kind of initiated hey what's up i'm like nothing man how you doing he's like all right how are you uh kind of shitty but whatever you know it's all good at that point this other guy comes off the patio of of the other uh home on the property that i lived at Uh and um this guy comes out of nowhere and that patio was dark our neighbors were not home so my theory is that this guy was probably trying to break in this guy was probably the lookout that's why probably why he initiated contact this that's just my theory i in, have no idea in your neighborhood this is on the strand right in front of my my home area okay um on on the strand in hermosa beach wow okay this guy comes out of nowhere and he goes what what the fuck you say to my boy i'm like nothing man i'm just on my way you guys have a good night and i walked in between them trying to kind of diffuse the situation like look i'm not trying to start anything with you guys you you know don't worry about me. I'm just on my way. Mm-hmm. I kept going. And about six or eight steps later, next thing I know, bam, my face just flies this way. And it was more of a, I, it wasn't a sensation of pain. It was the sound. It sounded like a, like if you snap celery. And I just immediately felt like this whole half of my face went over here. And um, before I could actually process any of that, bam, from that direction. 
And I probably took 12 to 15 shots to my face and head um, before I turned around and squared up. And I saw that both of them were, you know, coming at me from behind and they both had brass knuckles on. And my immediate thought was, I have worlds in six weeks. I don't want to break my hand on your dumb fucking face and not be able to hold my racket and go play for my country at world championships. So I kind of micro evaluating every little thing that happens to see if I need to defend myself or if I can just, you know, not participate in escalating it any further yeah. in the meantime this eye is just going like this like camera one camera two camera two is gone <laughs> like i can't i can't i can't see how this eye is just swelled shut okay and um i think the fact that i was not unconscious and i was not off my feet and i turned around and squared up i think that according to the police at the time they said that probably saved my life but um i don't think they were prepared for that so they had a little discussion and there was some words spoken but I wasn't paying attention to the words. I was paying attention to the body language of, do I need to defend myself now uh -huh. that I'm face to face? You chicken shits blitzed me from behind. I didn't see you coming the first time now that we're face to face. You know, I'm watching to see what happens. They ended up running off. I didn't want them to know that I lived right there. So I start walking towards Redondo Beach. It was only, we're only four houses over. So I start walking towards the Redondo Hermosa border to go this way and then come back home from on Hermosa Avenue instead of off of the Strand. Mm hmm and um i heard something i'm walking home like this right as i'm walking home like with this, your eyes swollen shut yeah and i'm walking home like this because i know this is gonna sound silly but you remember that first pirates of the caribbean movie yeah and that one pirate who had the wooden eyeball that kept falling out the whole movie and he's chasing it around the ship yeah. and all that i couldn't stop thinking about that i'm like oh my god if my eyeball falls out it's gonna get sand in it they're not gonna be able to put it back in it's gonna be gross so i'm walking home <laughs> like this right Jeez. i'm walking home like this holy shit so that my eyeball doesn't fall out <laughs> and um I hear something and I turn around and it was the dude who came off the patio. No. And he's running back at me like he, with his what fist the? up. Yeah. Dude. He's running at me like he's going to Superman punch me. So I'm I turn around and I go, dude, just stop. Just stop. And he's, he stops. And I did that for two reasons. One, I wanted, I wanted him to feel like, okay, I'm scared. You have the power. You don't have to prove anything else by hitting me again. Right. So I, I leave my hand out. The other reason I left my hand out was I have one eye. I have no depth perception. If he does come at me again, I need to be able to feel it because I won't be able to see it very well. So I left my hand out here and this is word for word exactly what he said. He goes, um, fuck you, bitch. I don't give a shit. I just got out of prison. I'll kill you right here and not give a shit. I don't care about you. I'll fucking kill you right here where you stand. What are you going to do, bitch? I'll fucking kill you. Huh. And I, I was like, at that point, I dropped both hands, made fists at my side, and I was just like, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm right here. Kill me. And I was, apparently, I didn't even think about this until somebody asked me about it three years after the fact. Um, apparently, I was okay with that being my last night on Earth. Because I didn't I didn't cry, I didn't beg, I didn't, you know, I didn't try to negotiate anything. Um, and I, for some reason, wasn't fearful of it. What, that's all I said to him, but was kind of going through my mind, I guess, when I said it was, I don't care that you're a guy. I don't care that you're bigger than me. I don't care that you have a weapon. I hit for a living and I know how to generate force. So you very well might kill me right now, but I will hurt you on the way down. So let's go. So that was kind of, I guess, what was going through my head. And he just looked me up and down and went and ran off again. And at, I'm, at this point, I'm like, all right, you you guys blitzed me two on one. The other guy hasn't come back. No, the other guy never never came back. Okay. I don't know where he went. But I'm like, you guys blitzed me two on one. You came at me a second time. I never went down. I was never unconscious. I was never off my feet. And I didn't throw a single punch. And you ran away from me twice. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I'm like, are we done now? And I wasn't even thinking about calling the cops. I didn't think I needed to go to the hospital. I had no idea how bad it was. Um, I was just, I walked home and went upstairs like this. And I'm like, I hope we have some Advil because this is going to be really sore in the morning. Okay. That was my, that was all. I wasn't thinking anything severe. Um, my girlfriend at the time had come around the corner after I had walked in and, and was fishing for the Advil. And she goes, Oh my God, what happened? I said, I got hit <laughs> shrugging everything. I go, I got hit. She goes, but who? I said, I don't know. Two guys downstairs. Why? I don't know. Where's the Advil? <laughs> so in the meantime, her friend that, that she was there with, um, had called 911. I don't even know. Uh -huh. I don't even know. Didn't even know that happened. Yeah. They seemed like they showed up in like 2.2 seconds. They the were, cops. Yeah. The, actually the ambulance cops didn't, Cops didn't come to talk to me for two weeks. I don't. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why. Did they catch the guys? No, never. No, 
and I asked for a sketch artist and they said no. Um, actually, if they, the, the two guys, there, oh, there was, was this 2008. Okay. There was a liquor store across the street. And when the cops finally went over there, like weeks later, the, the guys from that work at the liquor store said they were in here the next day bragging about it. Why didn't you show up sooner? Um, they had them on video, but those videos had since been recorded over because they didn't, they didn't, they didn't go over there for weeks. Uh huh. Anyway, so I end up going to the hospital, find out I had several facial fractures okay, and that the surgeons would be in to talk about it. And um, meantime, my girlfriend at the time ran over to uh, go down the hall and call my mom and tell my mom what happened. Mm -hmm. And the worst part of this entire experience for me was hearing my mother's shriek at the other end of the phone. Mm. She was beside herself, hysterical. Um, she came back, handed the phone to me, and I'm trying to calm down my mom. And it was, I mean, I never felt like a, a, a victim in the mm -hmm. first place, but hearing how that news affected my mother, like I knew that I never could be. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to calm my mom down. I'm like, mom, it's okay. I'm fine. She's like, no, you're not. I'm like, mom, I'm, I'm fine. At the end of the day, I just took some shots to the face. They didn't rape me. They didn't rob me. They didn't kill me. I'm fine. It's just a couple punches. It's all good. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So, and then my poor dad, um, I don't, I don't know how the news circulated to him, but he heard it, you know, 17th hand. And by the time that news got to him, it was that I had been beaten to death by a gang with baseball bats and I was dead. So <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, both of my parents flew, flew in as soon as they possibly could. Uh -huh. My mom was there like the next From Arizona. Morning. Yeah. Got it. And, uh, they both stayed about two weeks. Um, I got jumped on June 1st. I had facial reconstructive surgery on June 11th. Okay. And um, what exactly my, had your eye didn't pop out? I it did see. not, but I found out actually two years later because I was having issues. Um, I found out two years later going through the medical reports from that, that initial intake that, and, and I did have to, I had, I was seen by an eye specialist in, in the emergency room. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I did, I found out two years later that yes, it could have fallen out. And that it was probably wise that I that I did this for the oh time gosh. that I did. Um, I do still have vision issues. I, I still was about have... to ask: Does this bug? Does this bother you still? Yeah, actually, my pain level on a daily basis is ten out of ten or worse. I mean, I have days that are worse than that, and like, I'm basing that on headaches. I'm headaches. Um, anything. I mean, that, so my surgery was supposed to take between four and five hours, and it took over twelve. Um, it part, wow. most of that was because they didn't realize the extent of the damage. My, my bones were so shattered. They had to remove so many little pieces before they could begin reconstruction. That's what took so long. Oh my God. I ended up leaving the hospital with five titanium plates in my face. And even last year I had another surgery. I was supposed to have another surgery by the end of this year, um, that I haven't scheduled yet. Yeah. So, I mean, it's an, it's an ongoing thing. It's, it's, you know, it's just extremely painful every day, but I'm going to go back to the, to the, to the story real quick though, the mm -hmm. attack. Um, you know, when I finally did get home from reconstruction, you know, I'm getting the, all the phone calls and everything. And, and our U S team coach at the time called me and wanted to know, Hey, how are you feeling? What, what's going on? How are you? Mm -hmm. Talked to him and told him what the doctors have said, told him how the surgery went, all the things. And he ends up the, the conversation with, all right, kid, well, we're going to play our asses off for you. I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm going to be playing my ass off with you. He's like, you're, you're not going. I'm like, what? Don't you dare take this away from me. Don't you dare take Worlds away from me. Worlds is the reason I didn't hit back. Don't tell me that I can't go. Meanwhile, <laughs> I can't eat solid food. I've lost 37 pounds in less than two weeks. Did they wire you shut your no. jaw? Or they, no, no, they didn't. They just, they, they inserted a bunch of titanium plates. Gotcha. So you couldn't chew. Couldn't chew. Couldn't, Got it. Yeah. I couldn't eat solid food again until October. Yep. Uh, anyway, so that actually devastated me more than anything that happened from the attack. Mm -hmm. um, and was the fact that you, they I weren't going to let me go. They weren't going to let you go. Yes. And um, I mean, looking back on it now, like I totally understand why, mm. but I, but I know myself, mm. I know, I know me and I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I no. And um, yeah. so I, I, I got into a severe depression for, I don't even know how many days after that conversation. And then I just, I knew that I couldn't, I wasn't going to heal if I stayed in that depresso espresso <laughs> space mm -hmm. and I needed to get yeah, out of it. Absolutely. And so I sent an email and I copied, I think the board on it. And I said, dear Dave, apparently whether or not I go to the world championships is not up to me, but whether or not I am prepared for the world championships is entirely up to me. So you do whatever you need to do to make the best decision that you feel is in the best interest of team USA. But just so you know, 
whether I go to Ireland for the world championships or not, I will be ready to be the world champion by July 27th because that was the date that our flight was set to leave. Mm. And I hit send. And when was it when this email was sent? July 27th is Worlds, approximately. Uh, End of June. So apparently you end have a June. month, like, a like month maybe, and a like, half in advance. Le- probably less, probably about a month. Okay. Yeah. And um, And I hit send. And when I hit send, I knew that I had to release any attachment to any potential outcome. I couldn't count on it working. I couldn't count. I couldn't count on going and I couldn't count on not going. Like I had to just go about my business. Now, keep in mind, I was extremely heavily medicated. I was so medicated. They gave me a walker because I couldn't stand up by myself. I was not allowed to sleep laying down for the next eight weeks. Um, I had to sleep you had sitting to sleep up. Sleep sitting up. I, I, had to not, the, I had to do the same thing. Yeah. It's yeah. not pleasant. Mm-mm. And you don't really sleep. It's, no. it's almost impossible to sleep because everything hurts Yeah, and you can't get comfortable because you're not allowed. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that sucks. Um, the face is a very difficult, I, I had a facial reconstructive surgery when I was like 19 and oh, same wow. thing. They wired me shut and I medicated for a few weeks and couldn't yeah. sleep the whole thing. So it's, yeah. it's hard to describe that to people. Your nerve endings are firing your face. Mm-hmm. It's your face too. So you don't, yeah. it's not like you broke your arm. You can kind of isolate it in your arm. Your face is kind of hard to escape. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, I hit send and I released any attachment to the outcome of what, whatever would happen after that email. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I went about my training as best I could, which was literally sitting, watching video or sitting and, and just visualizing a workout like, like with weights, visualizing a two hour court practice in real time. So if it's going to take me two hours in, in real life to actually do it, I took two hours to do it in my mind on the couch. Wow. And that was, that was how I prepared. And then, um, I came back to Phoenix and trained with, uh, one of my trainers here in Fountain Hills for 10 days. And the most I could do was 10, 10 sets of one single leg step ups. That's it. Okay. I couldn't do anything else. Wow. Um, I mean, we obviously did more than that during the 10 days, but that, that first, that first day when that was all I could do and he sent me home, I'm like, Oh my God, what am I doing? Trying to go to worlds. Right. And then, uh, the, First, within the first two weeks of June, or I'm sorry, July, I went and signed up for an outdoor tournament in Huntington Beach, and I signed up and played three divisions, and I th- I think I might have won one, but I was genuinely pissed that I didn't win all three, and I had to have one of those, you know, custom-made masks. I was going to ask, face. did no yeah. one tell you, like, hey, if you take a ball to the face, it's oh, going to yeah. reactivate this entire process? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had I had a, I had a mask that was custom-made, and I had to wear that, and... um. Wow. Anyway, I, I, I played and our U.S. team coach had driven down from Stockton to kind of evaluate me when he found out I was playing. And he said, I did not expect that. He's like, you, you actually look pretty damn good. And we're kind of he was kind of what ifing me to death about, yeah, but what about this? And what happens if that? And what if, you know, and justifiably I so. Yeah, completely. I know part of it was concerned. For, most of it was concerned for my own health. Mm-hmm. And then the other small part of it was probably, you know, we, we need to do what's in the best interest of the team, which I also totally understand. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I guess one of the things I said to him that was that kind of basically shifted him onto my side of the I want to go mm-hmm. uh, was I'm like, Dave, I don't need my face to hit the ball. My arms and my legs still work. And he laughed. And he goes, yeah, you got a point there. I didn't really I didn't really think yeah. about that. <laughs> And he couldn't argue with that either. And plus, he just saw me play, you know, infinitely better than he expected me to, considering I'm still severely underweight, haven't been able to do anything physical until literally that weekend. Um, and then I went from there to a tournament in Pennsylvania. Can and, you still not eat solids when you're doing this? Are you still on a liquid based diet? I mean, no. I mean, I was on protein shakes, mashed potatoes, anything <laughs> soft, baby food, yeah. applesauce. Yep. Did you ever blend anything up? You ever do that? Okay. So when, so. Let me get to the climax of the story is that um, he actually did say, okay, yeah, you, you can go. And I went to Worlds. Yeah. And I won my first World Championship without losing a single game. I never even went tiebreaker. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So. A month after. T- uh, technically two months. Yeah. I got jumped June 1st, had facial reconstructive surgery on June 11th. And 64 days after getting jumped, 53 days after facial reconstruction, and 29 days after voluntarily ceasing all pain medication against medical advice, Yeah, um, I won my first world championship. Wow. That's outstanding. Yeah. And so that's... That's that's unbelievable. You know, when you ask, like, what, what platform do I have to speak from with, you know, helping people overcome things or find new perspectives or, you know, initiate some kind of shift for themselves... Um, mm-hmm. it's, I, I've been through some shit. Yep. Um, and that, and getting back to the book, that's the event that happened, but it's not just that event. It's, mm-hmm. 
other things that happened in my childhood. I was born with a deformity that I had to have a life-saving surgery that no surgeon wanted to touch because it was a one in a million something chance that I would live and a one in a something million chance that that surgery would actually work. So, you know, oh between God. that and a car accident that my mom and I were in and not wearing our seatbelts and we spun into a light pole and I got thrown forward, you know, I mean, like if I, I must be part feline and have nine lives, I think I got at least three, four, three or four left. <laughs> three down. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, there's just, it's not just those things, there's, but there's been a lot of, a lot of buildup of things in my life. Um, good and bad. Yeah. Um, not, not, not just all, you know, horrific, but uh -huh. you know, just a lot That's of, pretty a lot, unbelievable you a want lot, the world. That's a lot that incredible. I've learned from. There's just so much that I have learned from. Mm -hmm. And the, my, my purpose for speaking is, is I want to be able to help people so that they don't have to go through the shit that I went through to learn what I learned. Mm -hmm. And if, if there's anything that I can offer, even if, and, and it's, and it's not about, it's not about me. It's about knowing thyself. Let, mm -hmm. let me help you pry into the corners of yourself that can help you make some kind of adjustment that is going to propel you forward in, in what you say you want to, to be, what you want to become, what you want to do, what you want to achieve, where you want to go from where you're at now. Yeah. Would you say the process between June 11th and actually competing in Worlds was mostly difficult because of the physical, or was it more mental? I mean, what was the? It was. I a, can imagine a combination of both. It was. It was. My training was entirely mental. Until because I, you've been until told you're not future. going, that has to be just damning to hear mentally. Well, it was. That's why I had to send that email and be mm -hmm. like, "Look, whether I go or not, I'm going to be ready to go." Mm -hmm. In fact, I think I even said like, you know, so if you, if you don't take me and you guys don't do well, that's on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I, I had to, I had to become unattached from that outcome as soon as I hit send, Sure. which is why I had to send that. Yeah. So I was going to train whether I was going or not. And, and my training was entirely mental until like, I didn't, I didn't do any practice when I signed up for that outdoor tournament, mm -hmm. the second, like the second week of, of July, I hadn't touched a racket since whatever our last tournament was before that. Yeah. Actually that would have been nationals. Would have been national. So I, I hadn't touched a racket for over a month. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. What an incredible outcome. What did the co what did the coaches say? I mean, what, what did everybody say when that happened? When you won? I don't. I I honestly don't know. Only because I, I do remember there was a lot of people crying uh -huh. in, in in the stands and the coaching and you know even even my opponent. Um, I bet. And it was all, it was an all USA final. We swept that year. There was a both. USA singles players were in that final. Both men's singles players were in their final. Wow. And both doubles teams um, won their finals against the other countries. So we won, you know, the individual, all, all the individual awards. We won the men's overall, the women's overall, and the team overall. That's that's the last time, I believe, uh, we we swept the entire the entire event. That was in 2008. That's that's crazy. What yeah. a cool thing to happen too, where everybody everybody takes it home. Obviously, what you had gone through, I'm sure, was the giant most yeah. overshadowing peak of the whole thing. I'm sure everybody. Yeah, like, yeah, was we like, won. But like, oh my god, you're here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't get hit with brass knuckles before I came here. So yeah. <laughs> it's well, and and it was I it was um you know like I said I I'm really not sure what the immediate reaction was because I just I remember hitting the last shot. Mm -hmm. It was a backhand down the line winner. Sure. I remember going over to my opponent, giving her a hug and saying, great match. And, you know, congrats on, you know, we de genuinely supported each other, mm -hmm. you know, until we had to play against each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we hugged it out. And as soon as we let go from that embrace, I just, my back was to the crowd and I just kind of fell to the ground and started weeping because I'm like, the only thing that could go through my mind was I'm not even supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. And I meant that in two different ways. Like I, th that, that feeling was overwhelming in literally having my life threatened mm -hmm. literally all the things that could have been different that night on the strand yeah and then the fact that even though i i came through that night then them telling me that i can't go yeah not only did i go i won yeah. and and that that was so fulfilling to me not for the personal achievement but because i didn't let my team down wow i didn't let my team down i made a promise in that email that i would succeed mm. and i kept my promise to the team and that that all that, that, that dichotomy of sensation of I, I could literally be dead <laughs> or I could be alive and not here. And, and everything came together as cinematically as possible. Such an incredible story. Thank you. Wow. I'm serious. I, it's very rare we get that kind of <laughs> thing where I, I honestly don't really have any that much to say. Like, I, that's just an incredible story. Well, and, and so that'll be in the book kind of in the middle because that's that is kind of what the book is based upon is like, it's not just that though. It's everything that happened in my life before that leading up to that, that mm -hmm. allowed me to come through that the way that I did. Yeah. 
And then also, you know, the entire planet is still dealing with a post-COVID new normal that we're still trying to figure out what the hell that even is. And yeah. and this is my new normal. Every single day is, is excruciating pain and, and the ways that I have... Since 2008. Since 2008. Wow. Yeah. The best day I've ever had was an eight, an eight Ooh. out of 10. And, you know, continuing to need surgeries, continuing to have to see specialists, continuing trying to figure out why you know, the pain is the pain sensations and the areas that they're traveling to is expanding, not decreasing, oh, man. My nerves are shredded. There's yeah. Nothing I was you can about do to say this yeah. is neurological. Yeah. This there's is nothing all... they can do with shredded nerves. It's very hard. Um, so very tough to do. So have you ever tried hyperbaric? No, that what actually like may be to. a direction I would <laughs> steer you toward. Yeah. The, it, the, it, it only might thing, help. the only thing that has made it feel different, it didn't relieve the pain. Mm -hmm. It just sort of changed the pain sensation was uh, acupuncture. Mm hmm. Yep. But yeah, yep. I, I'd definitely be down to try hyperbaric. I'm I'm down yeah. to try tea leaves at this point. I mean, it, it, it hurts. But yeah. but that daily pain is my daily reminder of everything I have to be grateful for. What an incredible perspective. Well, this is this is this is the biggest lesson that I got from that experience that I am so completely grateful for is that nothing happens to you, it happens for you. Mm. And and that didn't I've never never seen that event as a tragedy. I've never seen it. To me, it's just something that happened. I'm not saying it's as insignificant as stubbing your toe on your pillow when you wake up, but it, it, that's just something that happened. This was just something that happened. This is just part of my journey. And if I could time travel, you know, would I still walk down the strand that night knowing what was coming? Yes, because I gained more from that than I lost. And that, you know, most people have that life changing event, that, that transformative thing that happened. And the only way that that transformed me was that it gave me so much more insight and knowledge into myself. Yeah. And what we are all capable of as human beings, if we if we know who we are. Yeah. And what? and and for me that that um, that perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can just analyze anything, anything that happens, good or bad, nothing happens to you. It happens for you. Well, I didn't. I you know I I didn't I didn't want I shouldn't have gotten that car accident. Well, what did you get from it? Mm -hmm. Did you, did you get, maybe you should wear your seatbelt. Did you get a new car? Did you get, you know, paying more attention so that you're safer on the road so you don't do this again? Yep. I mean, anything, you, if you can look through any experience. You have a very positive lens, outlook. Yeah. If you can look through, the, through any, through things at that, with that lens, everything changes shape. Yep. It's a, it's a really incredible, it's, and it's very empowering. Yeah. It's very empowering because it's almost like you're, I mean, it sounds like you're, you're, you have your own way of bending reality, mm -hmm. but you're bending it for benefit. Yeah. You're bending it for the greater good, yeah. not not the victimology of, of something that happened to you. A positive outlook will take you a lot farther than you ever think that it will. It's why sometimes whenever, it, in, really in, in this industry, in mine, I, I've heard just about every single possible excuse anybody could ever come up with for any problem that they have. Everyone's got problems. It's probably the only thing that all of us have in common. It's just how do we address them? Right. And you, you sometimes, at least I, maybe you as well, but I, I sometimes have to uh, sort of check myself and maybe, maybe open up the sensitivity lane a little bit when people are telling me their problems, because to me, I'm like, okay, look, I understand you have problems. I have problems. We all have problems. I have an outlook on my problems that may be a little bit more positive than yours, but let me kind of at least check that a little bit and you tell me what it is so I can try to relate to you. Right. But so oftentimes the battle for the change in anyone's position is in the mind more so than the external. I mean, your external circumstances sucked harder and worse than anything I've ever heard anyone go through. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's, that's truly terrifying to go through something like that. Even if you didn't have worlds taken away from you and then given back and all the other stuff that came afterwards, but to have that outlook, as you are on the couch, really, I didn't have that outlook when I was wired shut after having like my thing done. It is it, like, it's tough sometimes when you're injured and hurt. And especially even now, now that that lingers for you and lingering pain is very different than immediate pain. People with an injury that continues to talk to you, you come to appreciate the difference in pain and how it, in a way you do sort of just get used to pain, but you never get used to pain yeah. that continues to talk to you every morning and uh it, without the positive outlook i just don't think that anyone is capable of getting over that kind of a lingering injury especially again i you know what you and i <laughs> went through very different but having i mean my bro my jaw was broken in 12 places and then i have plates in my in my face too so do you beep at the airport you, yeah i do too sometimes. <laughs> yeah i do <laughs> i do beep at the airport they'll scan me and the symptoms like I'm like, oh, if I go to the dentist yeah. and then they clean your teeth and they scan it, he go, what is in your face? I'm like, oh, it's, it, I had surgery a while back, but it's, um, it, it's, it's very, very, very hard 
when it's neurological that yeah. lasts and it might only lasted for six months. It's tough to get past a lingering injury without that positive outlook. So I just, I think that's absolutely incredible Rhonda that you've oh, thank you. accomplished that and that you're still here, still kicking, still beating everybody. I'm sure <laughs> it's, it's yeah, that's, that's amazing. Thank you. Where can people find you? What's the name of your book? Is it out right now? Is it coming out? It's I'm still writing it. Okay. Um, but I, I, I have already said publicly, so I'll say it again. It's going to come out in late spring. So okay. I, that's, that's a public deadline that I gave myself. Sweet. Um, and it's, I'm sure you'll reach it. <laughs> it's going to be called Never Off My Feet. I like it. Because it's not, like I said, it's not just that one event. It's all the other events leading up to you know, other, other events that shaped me yep. to prepare me for how I responded to that. Um, and then, and then the can... aftermath of, of, you know, my, my new normal, mm -hmm. you know, for some perspective on, on everyone else trying to figure out their new normal post COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where would people be able to find it, purchase it, talk to you, all that, all the above. Okay. So, um, I got some socials, uh, Instagram mm -hmm. at Rhonda Rasich. Okay. Um, I have Twitter too, but I don't know if Twitter's going to live long enough for me to bother. That's fair. <laughs> saying, yeah. <laughs> saying my Twitter, um, Facebook. I believe is also Rhonda Rasich. They gave you your Facebook back. Uh, I had a I had a buddy of mine figure out how I could take it back. Got it. Uh, yep, there it is. Perfect. Yep, and and the book will be on. Uh, you'll have, I assume you have a link tree or something on yes. on all these platforms. Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Outstanding. Well, Rhonda, it's been a pleasure, been an honor. What a cool and terrifying and <laughs> unbelievably encouraging conversation. I, I can't say I've really ever experienced that kind of a roller coaster up and down of, of anybody that we've ever had on here. <laughs> so thank you. That was that was amazing. Well thank you for coming on the roller coaster with me, man. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. We'll cut it there, buddy.